The growing popularity of so-called superfoods has led to a boom in production of fruits like acai, avocado, and durian. Mm. But some may not be as wholesome as they seem. Avocado farmers in Mexico are picking up guns to defend themselves from cartels. Acai berries are painstakingly harvested in the Amazon, where farmers see very little return. And in Malaysia, durian farmers are losing their crops because of a controversial land battle. We journey through factory and forest to measure the true cost of our obsession with some of our favorite superfoods. Our first stop was the Brazilian Amazon rainforest, where most of the world's acai comes from. Harvesting acai is a dangerous job in Brazil. Workers climb thin palm trees deep in the Amazon rainforest. Ela pode chegar lá em cima no pegar do cacho, ela quebrar no meio que ela é frágil. These berries have become one of the most popular so-called superfoods in the US, and they aren't cheap. One bowl can cost up to $15. And while the berry has exploded in popularity in recent decades, small farms like this haven't really been able to cash in. To this day, most acai in Brazil is harvested by families on small-scale farms. But big plantations are on the rise, putting pressure on families like Lucas Nogueira's and a way of life that goes back generations. Mas é uma dávida de Deus. Uma importância muito grande para nós, para nossa alimentação, para nossa sobrevivência. So how did this Amazonian fruit become so trendy? And what is the true cost for the people who have been harvesting it for generations? Vem, vem junto. Aqui tem um cacho, aqui. Olha aqui, açaí. Olha aqui, açaí, ó. We met Lucas at the end of the 2021 harvest, but there were still some berries left on a few trees. His family's farm is roughly 70 miles from Belém, the capital of the state of Pará, which grows more than 90% of the acai produced in Brazil. The only tool they use to climb is a single piece of rope called a piconha. They used to be made of leaves. Essa folha aqui, a gente pegava torcia ela, aí passava por aqui, fazia isso para ver como como o tempo vai mudando, né? Today, Lucas' son Luiz Fernando will go up. Se tiver só pane que tiver maduro, não tá que vai parar. Pode subir, vai com cuidado. The trunks are so thin that climbers have to be lightweight. É perigoso sim. O cara tá lá em cima e uma árvore quebrar. É arriscado o cara quebrar o braço, quebrar o pé. At the top, they swing from the tree to reach multiple bunches. Going down can be dangerous too especially while carrying a large knife and holding an armful of branches. Dropping them could damage the fragile fruit. Graças a Deus eu nunca caí da saizeira. Quero que isso não aconteça comigo. Eu já caí três vezes da saizeira. Não me bati nenhuma vez, graças a Deus. And the risks don't end at the climb. Inclusivamente a gente anda é, nesses, nessas áreas. Tem muitos animais, né? Lucas and his family harvested 53 baskets like these in 2021, earning them an income of about $950. That's as little as 20 cents per pound. Meanwhile, a pound of processed acai sorbet can sell for $7 or more in the U.S. 
Part of the issue is that Lucas has to sell his acai as soon as possible because the fruit goes bad fast. That leaves farmers who don't have processing machines with little leverage to negotiate. Não tem empresa aqui na nossa comunidade. A gente vende para atravessador, para poder chegar na mão daquelas pessoas que vão beneficiar, que vão se dar bem. Merchants bring the acai to Belém by boat. It's a race against the clock to sell the fruit before it spoils, so markets run overnight. O açaí apanhado hoje, ele dura em máximo 48 horas. 72 é assim, extrapolando. The price of the baskets varies every day, depending on the demand. Hoje, em média, um paneiro desse que está custando, hoje, 60. Most of the açaí produced in the state stays in Brazil. But exports have skyrocketed, growing about 14,000 percent between 2011 and 2020. Você sabia que uma tigela de açaí nos Estados Unidos custa 80 reais, 15 dólares. Quanto? 15 dólares. 15 dólares? Não sabia não. Some açaí gets transported to processing facilities like North Açaí. Every day, 22 tons of fruit are turned into frozen pulp, the açaí that most people outside of Pará are familiar with. O açaí é uma peliculazinha com caroço. Então, 95% do açaí é caroço. This is the stage where we see the biggest jump in price, about 177%. Esse produto tem que estar congelado em menos de 24 horas. Aí a gente vem para cá. Aonde aqui é o túnel de congelamento. A polpa fica congelada nesses monoblocos, aonde a gente depois leva para a câmara de estocagem e guarda ele para vender ele no mercado internacional e nacional. Today, more than 70% of Brazil's açaí exports end up in the states. Nós estamos muito presente, muito forte, tá? Na região da Flórida, região de Nova York, região de Nova Jersey, aquela costa leste americana De norte a sul, nós estamos bem, bem, bem presente. The global market for açaí is expected to reach nearly 2.1 billion dollars by the end of 2025. Mercado como a China abrir as, as fronteiras para para consumir esse produto, nós estamos aument vamos aumentar. Açaí's popularity took off in other Brazilian states in the 1980s when it became part of workout culture in Rio and Sao Paulo. The Bulls made regular appearances in this popular 90s soap opera that took place at a gym. Its high-calorie content made it a perfect pre- or post-exercise food, and its antioxidants made it easy to brand a superfood. That came with claims that it can solve all sorts of health issues, like obesity, type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease, strokes, hypertension, high risk for COVID-19, cognitive difficulties sexual difficulties. But nutritionists say this narrative has been blown out of proportion. Wait a minute. One food can't do that, can it? No, of course not. Nonetheless, Americans were hooked and made all kinds of acai bowls, mixing in fruit, granola, honey, and more. But it's a far cry from the culture of the people who have eaten it for much longer. Indigenous people living in the Amazon have harvested and consumed acai for centuries, maybe even millennia, and it's still a staple food in the daily diet of people in Pará, who eat it fresh with savory meals. Lucas was 12 when he started climbing acai trees, and he still does, 36 years later. I took it for my consumption, to help my father. Então eu acharia que ele não tinha condição de me bancar, né? E aí comecei a apanhar o açaí, né? Para me manter, para minha roupa, para sortear meus calços, sapato. In recent years, açaí has also made headlines in American and Brazilian media for reports of children working in the industry. But farmers like Lucas say it's always been this way, and that it's normal for everyone in the family to help out and learn the trade. É uma cultura porque vai passando de pai para filho, de avô para para neto, né? Nowadays, Lucas owns this land along with 55 other families. These kinds of settlements are called quilombos or a quilombola community, and many go back centuries. They were established by enslaved Africans and Afro descendants 
who ran away into the jungle and started communities like this to survive. Many learned from indigenous people how to harvest and process native foods, including acai. The Brazilian government estimates there are nearly 6,000 quilombola communities in the country. And a 2013 study found roughly 75% still lived in extreme poverty. Mas é uma uma comunidade rica, né? A gente se diz assim pobre, mas se torna rico, né, de espírito. Lucas's acai trees grow alongside different native trees and plants. But larger monoculture plantations that produce more fruit are on the rise. The amount of land used for these plantations has more than tripled since 2006. These plantations are often located far away from floodplains where acai trees naturally thrive. That means big producers have to irrigate their acai trees, while farmers like Lucas rely on natural seasonal flooding from the nearby river. Isso sem falar no problema da biodiversidade por inteiro, né? Se você, enfim, transforma a Amazônia em plantios. Some small producers have also been favoring acai trees over others, which could become an issue in the long run. And experts worry that as acai's popularity continues to grow, the cultural traditions of Pará and the Amazon could be lost. Tendendo a transformar o acai numa commodity. Açaí is something Lucas and many people here take pride in. Esse aqui é o processo do nosso açaí para o nosso consumo local. A gente bota um pouquinho de farinha aqui dentro, né, do açaí. E aqui um pedacinho dele aqui, um pouco do feijão, um pouco do arroz. Aqui. Aí um pouquinho do açaí. Então experimente como nós, para vocês sentirem o sabor do nosso açaí paraense. O açaí normal, puro. E vocês vão ver a delícia que é o nosso açaí. Obrigado. Avocados are also touted for their health benefits, and global demand for the superfood is growing. Mexico is by far the number one global producer. But when a valuable crop meets organized crime, this can be a dangerous business. When we filmed their support in 2021, avocado farmers told us they had little choice but to take up arms to defend themselves and their avocados from cartels. They said their group, Pueblos Unidos, was a self-defense force. Since then, Authorities have linked the group to organized crime and carried out a series of arrests. Mexican media now report that, according to Michoacan State Security Services, the group has now been dismantled. This is avocado country. Most of the fresh Haas avocados sold in the U.S. are grown here in Mexico's Michoacan state. But where there are avocados, now there are also guns. Mexican farmers have formed a vigilante group to protect their land from drug cartels that have kidnapped and killed dozens of locals in the past year alone. We went to Mexico to investigate the true cost of our obsession with avocados. One in five people here work in the avocado industry. But many have left their jobs in the fields to help protect their livelihoods. La mera verdad, si se terminara todo esto, no sabríamos qué sería de nosotros. Volverían las extorsiones, las desapariciones. Y pues, estamos luchando más que nada por nuestros hijos y por, por nuestras familias. In August of 2020, they organized a self-defense movement called Pueblos Unidos, or United Towns. Es el gobierno, es el gobierno el que debe de hacer esto, no nosotros como campesinos humildes. They asked Insider not to reveal their names for fear of kidnapping or worse. The members of Pueblos Unidos have no official training. Most of the guns they carry aren't registered, and that's illegal in Mexico. 
But they say they're doing this because they have little choice, given what they're facing. Las constantes situaciones de inseguridad en la que vivimos, además de detectar personas armadas en los alrededores de nuestras comunidades. In the summer, they organized a rally to ask the local government for help. Le exigimos de la manera más atenta, tenga a fin de solicitar de manera urgente ante las instancias correspondientes un destacamento fijo y punto de revisión de la Guardia Nacional. Una fila aquí hay otra. Queda la otra. Hundreds signed a petition demanding more security. While the crowd waited outside, Pueblo Unidos delivered the petition to the mayor. The mayor eventually agreed to speak to the crowd. But she didn't make any promises. Claro que vamos a hacer el conducto para nosotros este poder gestionar alguna reunión a nivel federal. The government has provided some help, but locals say it's just not enough. Pueblos Unidos has set up more than 50 of its own roadblocks around four towns in the state of Michoacán. At checkpoints, they search cars for weapons. They patrol an area about half the size of Phoenix to keep the cartels out. They're mostly farm workers who didn't even know how to shoot before they banded together for protection. Now, they spend their time doing target practice instead of farming. Larger towns pay private police to keep the cartels out. Still, cartels are finding their way into every corner of the avocado trade. A 2019 report asked if avocados could be the next conflict commodity, since violence and corruption now pervade Mexico's avocado supply chain. The report also found that criminal groups steal four truckloads a day and have even started farming avocados themselves. Shipping and packing facilities have been attacked and extorted as well. This one, in a town called Tancitero, has been spared from attacks so far. Manager said locals here pay private security forces to keep the town and the packing plant safe. About 400 workers process over a million avocados a day. Michoacan processed 1.7 million tons of the fruit in 2020 and Mexico exported 1.3 million tons, mostly to the United States. Thank you very much. It all started in 1993, when the U.S. signed the North American Free Trade Agreement. I believe we have made a decision now that will permit us to create an economic order in the world that will promote more growth, more equality, better preservation of the environment, and a greater possibility of world peace. It lifted an 83-year ban on avocado imports from Mexico. <laughs> Americans went from eating about a pound of avocados a year in 1994 to more than seven pounds of avocados in 2018. Imports from Mexico exploded in this same time period. And the business is so lucrative that even the deadly violence hasn't stopped other newcomers from trying to break in, even though the best land is taken. Eduardo Montero and his partners are growing avocado trees on the side of a mountain that is rocky and exposed. Pero aquí podemos ver en lo que es la ramita de la flor, 
el golpe del granizo. Still, his family is well aware of how to deal with cartels. Nos ha tocado de que, pues de que nos cobran piso. Simplemente somos agricultores y nos cobran piso. Llega que por protección. If Eduardo can make it work, though, a 76-acre farm like his could bring in more than $200,000 in revenue at each harvest, with multiple harvests every year. And if the cartels charge him at local rates, he could probably expect to pay them about $68,000 in what is called piso, or protection money. Meanwhile, the world's love affair with avocados is expected to keep on growing. Demand is also sky high for durian. China just can't get enough of this spiky, smelly, yet delicate superfood. Malaysian farmers are cashing in on the craze. But in recent years, a dispute over land rights has seen thousands of trees cut down, and some farmers left with nothing. In 2021, we reported from Malaysia where competition for control over durian farms had turned Asia's king of fruits sour. A state government in Malaysia cut 15,000 durian trees. This is public land, and these farms are not technically legal. But farmers cultivated these trees for generations without problem. And they're the ones who popularized this special variety of durian, Musang King. It sold for an average $32.50 a pound in Malaysia during the 2021 season. That's more than double this season's average price for live Maine lobster. Farmers like Tom Wai Kiat say the destruction of durian farms is a scare tactic to either push them off the land or sign an unfair contract. Tan's father started growing durian here in the early 2000s. Tan took over the farm a decade ago, but in July, he lost everything. This is the first time Tan has seen his durian trees since they were destroyed. One TikTok video that went viral in Malaysia appears to show state authorities cutting down durian trees. This is what farmers saw when they returned to their land. Tan now works at a durian collection stall in Raub, a township of 100,000 people known as the durian capital of Malaysia. The fruits undergo a careful quality check here before it's picked up by local and international buyers. Tan says it's easy for him to tell good fruit from bad fruit since he's worked with durian most of his life. That's critical because buyers selling durian to countries like China expect the fruit to be flawless. The best durians come from trees that are more than a decade old. Workers look through up to 400 baskets of durian a day during the peak seasons, which run from July to September and December to March. The majority of durians exported out of this region end up in Singapore. Kelvin Tan runs the operation here at 99 Old Trees. He started this durian business in 2017. This storefront is just a small part of Kelvin's operation. He also sells wholesale frozen durian to buyers in China. Kelvin says business has never been better. Traditionally, every durian season, a lot of Singaporeans will travel up to Malaysia to eat durians there because it's cheaper there, right? Because of this pandemic, uh, most of these, they have no choice but to just eat in Singapore. That is why it has actually resulted in a higher sales for us. Tan sells nearly a dozen varieties of durian during peak harvest season. He's meticulous about the quality of the fruit. In a good Musang King, what we look out for is, number one, the colour, fragrance. Like when, the moment you open the durian, there should be a whiff of fra fragrance. And of course, uh, the creaminess. So, check out the creaminess. Okay, so this is an example of durian that 
cannot pass our quality control. These are all semi-ripe flesh. The taste is pretty awful. So for this kind of uh, substandard durian, we will have to reject them. Calvin's team sells up to 4,000 pounds of durian a day, up from nearly 900 in 2018. He says increasing Chinese demand and loosening regulations fundamentally changed the durian business. China imported a record $2.3 billion worth of durian in 2020, a number that has quadrupled since 2017. Farmers in Raub struggle to keep up with demand. Chiang Heng Mun has farmed durian for more than a decade. In July, the state government tore down two thirds of his trees. <laughs> Today, he's picking up the last durians of the season. The trees Chiang lost were the ones his father planted more than 20 years ago. Now he has 240 trees left on seven acres of licensed land. It's barely enough to support his wife, parents, and two children. The conflict began in 2020. That's when the government leased more than 5,000 acres of land in Raub to a private company, Royal Pahang Durian Group. Its biggest shareholder, the Malaysian royal family. The royal family, the state government, and the corporation are working together. And they've given farmers just two options, get off the land or sign a contract that caps profits, forces them to work, and gives them less money for small harvests. The 30 years period of the contract, you need to work inside your land. Abandon your land, you may be penalized. This is Chao Yu Hui. He's a state assemblyman for Raub's Chaz district. The Royal Pahang Durian Legalization Scheme is an unequal and unfair contract or scheme to the farmers that treated the farmers as a modern slave. Chao has been advocating for durian farmers for the past year. This is the action by the state government to create the fear among the farmers and force them to sign the unequal contract with the Royal Pahang Durian. Farmers refused to sign the contract and filed a lawsuit instead. They also organized to form the Save Musang King Alliance. The state government told local journalists that the trees it cut down were in a national forest preserve. Farmers argue that the land was protected by a January court decision. The state that governs Raub declined to comment to Insider, as did Royal Pahang Durian Group, citing an ongoing lawsuit with farmers. You have a Malaysia's durian business continues to expand. Royal Pahang Durian Group plans to build the largest durian processing facility in Malaysia. And by 2030, the country's durian exports are expected to increase by 50%. But will small farmers see any of the profits? Or will the durian craze cost them everything?